Broadcasting from the studios of WKEN, where every day it's the weekend. It's the Ken Calvert Show with your host, Ken Calvert. Uh oh. Sounds like somebody's got a case of the Mondays. <laughs> Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Ken Calvert Show podcast. And uh, we are coming to you from the casual studios of WKEN, where every day is the weekend. And I hope you had a great weekend. A lot of people having that four-day weekend, enjoying quality time, I hope, with your your family and, of course, all of your relatives, and uh, hopefully no fights broke out at your table. I had a great one, by the way. Thank you for asking. Here it is, Cyber Monday. Did you shop, shop, shop till you drop, drop, drop? You know, I don't think I've ever participated in Cyber Monday, but I'm thinking as soon as I'm done here... Uh, doing my favorite thing to do, which is a little podcast for you guys. Then I'm going to jump online and look for some broadcast equipment and see if the deals are right. But that aside, we've got some bad Midwest weather going on here in Detroit. Not as bad as they had predicted, but nonetheless, it feels like winter. It looks like winter. It must be winter, but guess what? It's not winter. We have another three weeks, another three weeks of fall, and uh, then officially it's winter. So I will shut up and quit grousing about it. On today's podcast, I'm featuring, as I've told you many times before, I've gone back and restored, cleaned up, and found hundreds of older interviews that I've done over the years, going back to as far as the 80s. And God only knows how badly I would love to have figured out some way, somehow, of keeping the ones that I did back in the mid-70s, and especially the early, early 80s. But you know what? They're they're off in space somewhere, and I'll never, ever get to touch them again or hear them. I was an early fan of Yes, and today's... Uh, and I want to go back to that when I say I was an early fan of Yes. On today's podcast, I'm featuring a 2012 interview I did with Chris Squire. Chris Squire was involved, by the way, in virtually every Yes album ever recorded. He'll talk about that in the interview. As I said, I was an early fan of Yes, especially the Yes album, I've Seen All Good People, Yours Is No Disgrace. That was a very popular record in college, and it was in everybody's apartment. Now, I say this because I liked Yes early on, although I have to be honest with you, I fell out of like with Yes in the mid to late 70s. Although I have to say, their staging... And their sound was way ahead of the norm or the curve. The never-ending, ceaseless song arrangements that they did, both on vinyl and on stage, did me in. You would go to a Yes concert, and they did six songs, maybe only five. I could not do it. However, one thing I did find out from all of the fans of Yes over the years of doing radio and talking to those fans... They not only like Yes, they love Yes, they adore Yes, and they liked all of the trappings that came with Yes, either album or concert. As I said, I caught up with Chris Squire. This was August 2nd, 2012, four days before they were coming to town to play DTE with Procol Harum. Now, we only had 10 minutes, so it's a short one, but it's packed, and it's got some good stuff in it for you. And I wanted to share it with you on my Monday Memories On May 19, 2015, Yes announced that Squire had been diagnosed with acute erythroid leukemia and would take a break from performing while receiving treatment. In the late evening of June 27, 2015, Chris Squire died from the illness at the age of 67 while receiving treatment in his adopted hometown of Phoenix, Arizona multi-talented guy, very, very friendly guy, very, very interesting guy. So have a listen. Hope you enjoy it. This is Chris Squire going back. Oh, gosh, what would it be? It would be six years ago. And thank you for joining me on the Ken Calvert Show podcast, and I will see you soon. Hey, Chris, how are you? Uh, Pretty good, thanks. Congratulations on another great tour so far. I know it's been a lengthy one so far, but uh, uh, Chris Squire, my guest, Ken Calvert, your host, and uh, and uh, welcome. First of all, welcome to the show. And um, you worn out, or are you still enjoying it? Oh no, no, we're having a good time on this tour. Um, uh, we never worked with Purple Harum before, but they're, they're, they're a good bunch of guys to have along, and um, 
and the audiences seem to be appreciative of both bands. So uh, it's rough and it's going well. You know, it's interesting. I was talking with uh, Robert Lamb from Chicago um, yesterday, as a matter of fact, and, and they're performing with the Doobie Brothers. And he said, you would be surprised. We don't spend that much time together as bands. He said, we had a, a night off and we all went to dinner and there was about 32 of us. And it was one of the yeah. be- one of the best times we've had because we we haven't had a chance to share anything but a you know nice job mate nice job thank you you know what yeah. I mean so uh, well, yeah that, that that happens on tours you you end up in a location somewhere usually in Spokane or some somewhere like that yeah <laughs> you have well, you have a day off and uh, you know and you go out for like a tour a tour dinner yeah. and. Uh, I usually have members of the various crews get really drunk, and it becomes an entertaining evening. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like I should be a member of that crew. Um, uh, Chris, let me let me talk to you about something I've always found fascinating. I, I, I'll, I'll go back to Robert Lamb, but I'll also talk about David Bowie. I'll talk about Mick Jagger. What is it about it, uh, especially uh, you Brits, that uh, it seems you all started in the church choir? Yeah, well, I think it was pretty common when we we were kids, you know. I mean, I was you know, in the 50s, you know, when I was a kid. But, you know, you either would be uh, joining the Cub Scouts, uh, and which I did, actually, and then I didn't really like it that much. So I remember my mother saying to me, well, you can leave the Cub Scouts if you join the church choir. So I did that. Wow. And then I, then I, so then I found myself... Um, uh, enjoying the music thing, you know, when I was a kid, and uh, you know that stuck with me ever since. I guess that's the same story for, for a lot of us. When did you realize, if you don't mind my asking, that you had some sort of a gift that was more than just a hobby? Well, um, I, once again, it was. I think it's just a matter of timing. I mean, I was 15 years old in 1963 when the Beatles broke, and uh, you know, of course, I looked at that and I thought, well, that looks like a good job. And, uh, you know, so I just gravitated towards, um, you know, um, forming bands and uh, groups, as we were called the men. And, you know, and, uh, you know, and I just got to, you know, transfer my previous knowledge from the choir music uh, into in sort of like uh, a pop music, really, and um, yeah. pop music, stroke rock music. So, you know, I just kind of, I just have, I think I was just at that right age, you know, at that, that time to be a prime suspect for that, uh, you know, to go into the the music business. And, um, and I still am here. <laughs> Chris Squire, it's interesting, though, because you and because you've been on, on virtually every single album recorded by the band, yes. Yeah, I've been on everyone, yeah. Yeah, and uh, obviously the, the founding member. Uh, but you guys took it into a direction, a couple of different different ways. Musically, I think Mysterious comes to mind. I give you guys credit for being the first band to really decide to make the stage a very big part of your show. Yeah, yeah, we did. Of course, back in the day, we, uh, uh, you know, we we uh, of course had hooked up with Roger Dean uh, as as our album sleeve designer back in uh, 1971, and. Uh, you know, and then because of his imagery, and uh, we we started, we took the the image of his uh, album covers and and uh, translated that into stage props, and uh, and of course we had a very good uh, lighting guy too back in the, in those early days, and he later went on to be actually become the biggest uh, uh, stage builder, um, and is still today in America. Yeah, uh, that's eight. At St. Towers there in Pennsylvania, and they make stages for every major act these days. But he was our first lighting guy, so we had a good theme from the beginning, and yeah, we and we put on a, a good visual show for people as well as the music. But what I'm saying is that that is done now by most every band with the video boards and the lighting and the smoke and everything else. But you guys, I think, were the pioneer, not pioneers. Yeah, well, yeah, we were early on. Yeah, yeah. We, we pretty much started as we were. Pioneering sound as well, because you know when we first started, the, the, the sound systems were just a couple of little um, speaker columns on either side of the stage. Uh, you know, in the sixties, and and uh, I guess we we were the first ever band in Europe, anyway, to even have a proper sort of like JBL uh, system with the horns and 
and the big bass bins. And, uh, of course, that was a big advantage to us because no one had heard that kind of power before. So uh, people were, you know, would come to see us for our PA system. <laughs> uh, I remember seeing you at least twice or three times at Kobo, and now, unfortunately, yeah. Kobo in Detroit downtown proper is being destroyed. It's being raised, and I remember seeing you there. And you had to be locked and loaded because your songs were already long, but at the live stage, they even got longer. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Well, we, we, we pioneered that whole long-form, uh, you know, the music uh, musical form, you know, but, um, you know, we started really, really with the Close to the Edge uh, track being uh, 20 minutes long, and then, you know, we carried on uh, into the Topographic Oceans and and um, uh, you know, Relaya uh, had um, Case of Delirium as a long track. So yeah, we pretty much uh, pioneered that. So definitely that long form kind of music. Well, it made it easier to fill the album. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, of course. I, no, but we but we enjoyed it. I think it was a lot to do with the fact that John Anderson and I both had a uh, a love of classical music, and uh, so you know, we wanted to basically do rock music that was a little more like high school music, and that's kind of how that developed. I know you're pressed for time, so I'm going to go quickly now and just ask you, yeah. some, ask you some things. Um, uh, did you have a chance to watch the opening ceremonies for the Olympics? I, I, on and off, yeah. We were doing a show that night, uh, and uh, we recorded it, and I've, I, I've seen bits of it. I haven't seen all of it. Yeah, but... but um, is 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 that something you would have if had had you been invited? Would you have participated? Uh, maybe uh, it just didn't come up because we were already uh, busy. So I, I don't know. I think that, that maybe at the closing ceremony they're going to have a bit more rock and roll. Yeah, they're going to have. So, the, yeah, the Who will be there. The, that uh, and they're going back out. They're going to be coming through town. Uh, recreating yeah. Quadrophenia, which I think will be outstanding. The current health of John Anderson. Yeah, um, apparently he's he's um, much better these days, and um, and he goes out and does these um, smaller club, uh, the one man kind of shows. And I know he enjoys doing doing that, and um, yeah, so yeah, so I think his health's in a much better place these days. And and you're you're currently working with John Davison. John Davison, who has come in as a big surprise uh, to us um, uh, as being really, really good as a, as a singer, uh, much better than one, one could have expected. So we're having a really good time with him. What, was it you, uh, uh, Chris, that, that that was the fan of Simon and Garfunkel? Uh, yeah, me and, uh, and and John Anson at the time. When, when we first met, we, we, uh, that was one of our common uh, artists that we liked. And one of the uh, truly eclectic and great versions of America that you covered. Yes, we're doing that on this show, too. Oh, no kidding, no kidding. Yeah. Well, all right, well, we look forward to seeing you on August 6th. It's uh, Chris Squire, my guest, along with Procol Harum. Have you had a chance to step outside and look at uh, uh, their act at all? Uh, yeah, yeah, I've, I've, I've caught some of the show, and, uh, uh, yeah, they're, they're a really uh, cool man to be uh, playing with, so... Definitely, if you can show up and catch their act, I, I would say that's uh, definitely a good thing to do. How, many, how long are you doing? Uh, I know that there, there's time restraints with uh, with our interview right now, and also on stage uh, at uh, yeah. at Pine Knob. Yes, he's playing for a couple of hours, and uh, I think Procol Harum play, play for one. Okay, well, listen, I, I know you're in a hurry, sir, so I, I want to thank you for taking the time, Chris. I want to see everyone at Pine Knob on August 6th. All right, thank you so much, Chris. You can subscribe to the Ken Calvert Show podcast on Apple iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify, or iHeartRadio. It's also available by going directly to www.thekencalvertshow.com. You can reach Ken at kencalvertpodcast at gmail.com. The preceding program is the property of Ken Calvert and may not be rebroadcast without the written permission of Ken Calvert.